Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And President, I'd like to thank you and the General Secretary and the Executive Council for allowing me a few minutes to introduce this debate, this important debate on the economy. Uh, the motions before us today concern not just the key areas of employment, pensions, public finances, wages, but it's also about the quality of life in our communities, for individuals, for families, for workers, for all those things that enable us to flourish as a community which GDP cannot adequately measure or track. A society is more than the sum of individuals or households, and a properly functioning economy is one where people not only have the right, theoretically, to employment, income, public services, but the practical right to participate in decision-making on the production and distribution of goods and services that make those human rights uh, real and meaningful. We are emerging from a lost decade of falling income, public services, diminishing, great uncertainty and instability in the economies of Ireland and Europe. Some progress is being made recently in relation to both employment and income for some households, but far too many households still live in poverty and far too many children suffer from a lack of proper support and investment in early years. The trade union movement needs to continue its work of defending and advancing the interests of working people, all working people, not just, not just those who happen to be members of trade unions at this time. The survival and future relevance of the trade union movement will depend on its capacity to demonstrate that it delivers economic and social progress for its members, but also that it can forge alliances with civil society for the promotion of social justice and equality. But that is not all. Defending and advancing the interests of working people is only two wheels of the carriage. We need to acknowledge and talk about two other wheels, and these relate to society, economy, and all the political arrangements that we envisage in 10, 20, or 30 years' time. If we are not to fall into the trap of another boom in house prices, with wages and services struggling to catch up with a rising population and the housing market under severe stress, we need a radical change in the direction, purpose, and implementation of public policy. And I'm afraid that I don't see much evidence that lessons really have been learned from the recent economic collapse, and furthermore, that the will and the understanding is there to shift, to effect a shift in public policy. However, it is easy to be critical and to say what is wrong. To outline, substantiate, develop, and argue for an alternative political economy on the island of Ireland will require understanding, wisdom, tact, courage, perseverance, and leadership from the trade union movement. In other words, from us. Who else is going to do it? Who else is there to lead the debate intellectually in the public marketplace for ideas? Where else is the potential strength in the numbers and diversity and expertise and involvement in the real economy? What if we are the people we are waiting for to provide this leadership, intellectually, organizationally, and in every other way to affect a fundamental shift in thinking and in behavior? And what if this shift in thinking and behavior will involve for us difficult, unpopular, and hard to argue for policies? What if it means arguing for a reform of our taxation system so that the overall level of taxes are adequate to provide services at a European level. Present yourself at a French hospital for non-emergency treatment. The first question you will be asked is, what is your insurance number, your social insurance number? Present yourself in a hospital for non-emergency treatment in this part of the world. The question will be, are you public or private? If you're private, what's your private and health insurance number? And what if it means that arguing for limits to disposable income or pre-tax wages up to half a million euro 
to begin to reverse the growing economic inequality of recent decades? What if it means for us to argue for a threshold of decency where all workers have a living wage, not just in terms of pay per hour, but in terms of hours per week and income per year and decent conditions of employment, such are outlined in the Congress Charter uh, for Work North and South? And what if it means that we have to argue for the development of a strong indigenous exporting platform for enterprises, North and South, so that we can wean ourselves gradually off an over-dependence on foreign direct investment for exports and for innovation? What if it means that we have to argue for an expanded and more dynamic state enterprise sector and more effective participation and partnership amongst various agencies in the world of research, higher education, private enterprise? What if it means establishing a proper state development bank as proposed in Motion 5 from the Irish Banking Officials Association, which we will be considering later uh, this morning? And what if it means that we have to move towards a common consolidated corporate base in Europe where regions and countries can no longer free ride and dump on others in a bid to attract investment but ultimately deprive citizens, whether in Limerick, Limavady or Lesotho, the essential public services needed in a civil civilised society and for which corporations should pay their fair share of taxation. And what if it means that we have to move gradually towards a more European, never mind Scandinavian, level of employer social security contribution? What if it means arguing that workers are better if their growth in wages is balanced by a growth in the social wage? And what if it means that workers from the lowest paid to the highest paid contribute to a real and actually existing insurance, social insurance fund which will pay for health and lifelong learning and will protect our incomes when sick or pay pensions when we retire. I'm going to quote Milton Friedman, probably the first time he's been quoted at a biennial delegate conference uh, of this movement. There is no free lunch. And the choice is ours as citizens whether we fund investment in children through education, health and community services paid for out of local or central taxation or whether we move to offload this responsibility to markets. The choice is ours whether we fund investment so desperately needed in homes for people, in mental health services, in water, broadband, renewable energy and other key services rather than through a reliance on the markets, or in some cases, even philanthropy. Citizens and workers deserve better. We deserve choice, responsibility, and participation in the decisions that shape the future. And the trade union movement can play a leading role, if it wishes, in shaping that public debate. Or it can sit back and allow others to drive the debate, but in ways that are inimical to working people and to the interests of those who are voiceless, marginalized, and excluded. And here, I must mention the continuing discrimination against the young unemployed because they are under 26 years of age, the treatment of lone parents, and the scandal of direct provision. We know that the debate and the direction of public policy in Ireland, the UK and Europe has been hijacked by forces and ideologies that risk the peace, coherence and very survival of a democratic, liberal and social market economy. These forces will not stop until most public assets have been put up for sale, until wages have been driven down and employment conditions restructured and flexibilised to the point of surrender and until spending and taxation have been reduced to pre-World War II levels as a percentage of GDP. The Irish and British governments lead the way in cutting back on the state and the share of public spending in GDP or GNP. The rest of Europe is urged to follow this example. Following the historic events of recent days, we need to stand in solidarity with the people of Europe 
for a reversal in the disastrous policies of fiscal austerity, privatization, and wage cutting. Rights of collective bargaining, defended by the Greek government as part of their negotiations, to which there has been very little attention given. We've heard only about VAT and corporate tax and such measures, but the right to collective bargaining has been a key redline issue for the new Greek government. This needs to be strengthened and coordinated through a policy of investment and wage-led recovery across Europe and a strategic program of investment in renewable energy needs to be central to European policy making. New hope and courage has been created as a result of the resounding articulation of the democratic voice of the Greek people last Sunday. And we should be pressing home the message that public debt is not sustainable for the Greeks and it's not sustainable for the Irish. A program of write down in debt as well as rescheduling of debt is necessary at European level and even the IMF recognizes that. Also, we need to focus much more on the problem of private household debt where many people and many small and medium sized enterprises are crippled by unsustainable levels of debt. The answer to the problem of debt, whether public, corporate or private, is investment, growth and redistribution. The evidence shows that societies that promote equality can achieve high levels of growth and productivity. Looking back over the last few decades with the collapse of communism, Euro-communism and pre-third way social democracy, it seems that a specter is haunting Europe and it is a specter informed not by worthy visions, ideals and shared values, but by narrow national self-interest, the interests of capital over labor, and the supremacy of the market. Europe seems to be less and less democratic, less and less social, and for that matter, less and less liberal, and its modus operandi has become more that of fear, intimidation, and a false pragmatism. I take some hope and inspiration from the poem of Liam McQuistine, engraved on the walls of the Garden of Remembrance in Parnell Square, Dublin, written in English, French, and Irish. Maybe Dublin City Council could put up a Greek version of it. And it reads in English, the vision became a reality. Winter became summer. Bondage became freedom. And this we left to you as your inheritance. O oh, generations of freedom, remember us, the generations of the vision. And I think it sounds even better still in the language in which Liam McQuistian wrote this poem. Rinu firene den ashling, rinu saure den givre, rinu sirshe den thirshe, agas dogam ar agifshe mar airachti, a glunt in the seersha, queenigi oringe, glunt in the hashlinge. Is shinna glunt in the hashlinge. We are the generation of that vision. Agus biachtus leshen diasporat, let the debate begin. <laughs>